Hello everyone. So today we're going to be looking at a super small server that's smaller than an Apple Mac Mini. But unlike the Apple Mac Mini, the LinkStation N2 allows us to be able to change and upgrade the storage. Anyway, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's go back in time and do the unboxing. Okay, so this is how the link station comes. Let's take off the cellophane wrapping. Now the box I think looks really nice. And if we open it up carefully. Inside, we've got the user manual and Unraid license. Obviously the unit itself which looks very nice here. And under here, we've got the accessories, a screwdriver kit, a power brick, and a power cord. Okay, so let's put this away for the moment. And let's focus on the unit itself. Now this really is a tiny Unraid server that uses very little power. And if we have a look on the back here, we can see various ports that it's got. So here we can see there's an audio out, a reset button, HDMI out, a USB 3.2 port, two USB 2s, and here is a 10 gigabit LAN. And then to the right here is the power, which is a DC barrel jack. And I think a lot of people may expect the N2 to have USB-C for power, especially as the N1 didn't. Now USB-C is everywhere and it's convenient, but I think for a device like this, it isn't actually the best choice. Because if someone was to power their link station with a USB-C charger that supports multiple devices, ones with multiple ports, they reset power delivery whenever you plug in or remove another device. This happens because the charger has to renegotiate power distribution to all of the connected devices. Now for things like phones or laptops, that's fine because they have a battery that can handle the brief power loss. But for the link station, a mini server, it needs constant uninterrupted power. So if we were using a multi-port USB-C charger and plug something else in, even for a second, it could cause the N2 to shut down or crash. So that's probably why they go with the barrel jack. So people use the charger that ships in the box with it that they know is gonna be reliable. Anyway, I'm gonna turn the device over. And if you're familiar with the LinkStation N1, which was a very similar device to this, this device has got extra cooling. In this device, there's both active and passive cooling. And obviously behind here, there's a fan. And here, we can take off these two flaps, which gives us access to four NVMe slots. And the great thing about these NVMe slots, if you can see here, it's a totally toolless design. So I'm gonna pop some NVMe's in here, a two terabyte one here, and three four terabyte drives. Okay, so super easy to put the drives in with the tallest design. And here, these are solid metal along with the whole of the case. And if we take off this layer here, we've got a nice thick thermal pad here that's gonna go across the NVMEs, which will help keep them cool. So if we turn the unit over here, we can see on the front here, we've got various status lights. But here, if we pull this down here, we've got a USB type C. And here, we've got two drive trays. Where we can put in 
another two SSDs, this time SATA SSDs. And so this is why we've got the little screwdriver in the pack here. If we undo this bag, inside here we've got the, the screws allowing us to attach the hard drives. And they even give us one extra screw in case, like me, we drop one on the floor and should lose one. So along with these two drives here, we've got a total of six SSDs which fit into this unit giving us a nice compact, a nice 4 NVMe, 2 SATA SSD, flash based, compact, power efficient, unraid server. And just to give you an idea of size, here is a Mac Mini, which in fact is actually bigger than the LinkStation N2. Okay, so I'm going to plug a LAN cable into the back here and plug the power in. And to test the power, I'm going to plug the power adapter into my Tasmota power monitoring plug here. And then on the front of the unit here, on the right hand side, I'm going to press the power button and we can see those status lights lighting up now and a nice blue bar along the bottom. Now you don't need to, but if you do have an HDMI cable plugged into the monitor, you can watch the Link Station boot. So there we have the Link Plus splash screen and straight into the Unraid OS boot up. At the end of the boot up, we're going to be able to see an IP address, which we can type into the browser to get to the Unraid GUI. Or we can just type in tower.local, which will also take us to the GUI as well. So long as we don't have another server on the local network that's named the same. But before we log into the web GUI, we are going to need our Unraid license. If you remember, we had this earlier. Now on the front of the license, there's a little kind of scratch card bit. We just scratch that off and that will reveal the activation code, which we'll use to activate the license in a moment. Okay, so the first thing we have to do is create a password. And you're going to need this password every time you log into the web UI. So I've set mine. Then next here, we need to redeem our Unraid OS activation by clicking on this button here. Because the link station comes with an Unraid OS license in the actual box and you put your activation code here. Then the wizard will just guide you through activating your server. Then you can set up your storage how you want it and start using the server. Okay, so here I am booted up into the N2. Now the first thing I did is I upgraded Unraid to the latest and greatest version here. And you can see I've set up my storage. Now all of my storage here, as this is a fully flash-based NAS, I'm using ZFS for everything. My main pool here is three 4TB NVMEs in RAID Z1, giving me a usable space of 8TB. And the others here are just single drive Z pools. Now if we go across to plugins here, and I've installed my go-to plugins that I normally install on all of my servers. So I've got the system temperature, GPU statistics, Intel GPU top, because the N2 has an Intel iGPU, so I can use that for transcoding. The Tasmota plugin, because I use a Tasmota plug for monitoring power. Unassigned devices, user scripts, and ZFS master. Okay, so let's start and have a look at what the hardware is inside of this server. Now the CPU is the Intel N100. This is a very energy efficient CPU, but also has an iGPU, so it can be used in a media server if you need to do transcoding. Now the RAM in this server is 16 gigs. This is like fixed and can't be upgraded. Now one thing about the N100 is it gives us nine lanes. So our NVMEs using these nine lanes are probably not going to be able to run at the full native speed for the drives. Now, if I go across to settings here and to user scripts, I've made a little script that will take a look at this and give us a little bit of information. So what we can see here, here are the four NVMEs that I've got inside of the NAS. 
Now running our script, we can see that each of our NVMEs, they're operating at PCIe Gen 3 times one which limits their maximum speed to around 800 megs per drive. Now whilst these drives do support higher speed, the N2 is limited to the lane allocation, so these drives can't get to their full potential. But one thing to remember is if you use them in a pool, and I've got three of mine in RAID Z1, the overall performance will be faster than a single drive, especially for read operations. So whilst each drive is limited to Gen 3 times one at 800 megs, working together in RAID Z1 allows for parallel data access, which will improve the overall speed compared to just using one drive. Now checking the SATA speeds here, we can see that both drives are running at six gigabits per second, which is the expected speed for SATA 3. So this means they're not bottlenecked at all and should deliver maximum performance at around 5 to 550 megs per second. Unlike the NVMEs, the SATA interface is not affected by the PCIe lane limitations. Now another way we can look at things is we can use something called LS Topo to get a visual representation of inside the link station. So to do that, I'm just going to type LS Topo and then the location of where I want the image to go. I'm going to put it in the system share. And so here we can see how the NAS is put together. So here is the 10 gigabit ethernet. Now looking at the PCIe speed of our 10 gigabit ethernet adapter here, we can see it's running at PCIe Gen 3 times two, which provides around 1.97 gigabytes per second of bandwidth. And so 10 GBE, it only needs 1.25 gigabytes per second. It means that the 10 gig LAN is gonna be able to run at full speed. So that's really awesome. And again here, we can confirm the NVMEs here are PCIe 3 times one. So what does all this mean in practice then? Well, since our NVMe drives are limited to PCIe Gen 3 times one, each one is maxing out around 800 megabytes per second. However, when we use them together in say a RAID Z1 pool, their combined performance, it will easily saturate a 10 gigabit ethernet connection. And our 10 gigabit ethernet adapter is running at gen three times two, so it's providing more than enough bandwidth to handle its full 1.25 gigabits per second throughput. So despite the NVMe lane limitations, the system can utilize full 10 GBE network meaning there's no bottleneck when transferring data over the network. So obviously it's been really well thought out and it's very rare that you'd ever be moving data from one pool to another inside the NAS. So no bottleneck when transferring over the network. I think this is a great little unit. Okay, so let's go back to the main tab. Now, one great thing about this NAS is it's totally inaudible. I can't hear a thing when it's running. So you're gonna be able to have it right on your desk and it's not gonna disturb you at all. And another great thing about this NAS is when there's no workload on the NAS, we can see the NAS is just idling here. If we look here, we can see the N2 here is using 12, 13. Occasionally it will spike up a bit, but it's generally using under 15 watts idle. Now we can see here the CPU temperature is 56 degrees Celsius which I think is about 132 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so let's put a bit of work onto the server. Now we can see here, I've got a Jellyfin container running here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play something on here. And there we can see the iGPU being used. And we're using around 50%, well, up to 60% CPU. So let's see how much power it's using, playing back some media. So playing back media, we're looking at around 20 watts, that's really awesome. Up to 25 there, but really between 20 and 25 watts for playing back media, I think is pretty good. Okay, so let's stop this now. And also let's start up this VM. And we can see the NAS, it can actually run a light VM. It's running this Pop! OS VM here. Now, obviously you're not gonna be running any gaming VMs but really a good VM to run on the, and running the VM we can see it's using in between say 50 to 70% of CPU usage. But a good use of a VM on something like this, I think would be running a home assistant VM. It would run that really easily. That's um, very, very light. Okay, so what do I think about the N2 overall? 
Well, I really like it. It's a nice little NAS. Now, if you already had the N1, I don't really think it would be worth upgrading to the N2 unless you really, really wanted 10 gigabit Ethernet. But if you didn't have the N1, I think this is a real great buy. You know, one, you've got the 10 gigabit Ethernet. Now, even if you don't have 10 gigabit, and you can see here I don't, mine's running at 2.5 here because I don't have a 10 gigabit switch. But if I was to buy a 10 gigabit switch, well, this is future proof for me and I can run things faster over there. Now it's great, it's got the N100 because it's so energy efficient. You know, one thing I really wish is NVMe drives are a little bit cheaper because if you want a large amount of storage, it is quite expensive buying flash media, whether it's NVMe's or SATA SSDs, you know, four terabyte drives are still probably 200 to 250 dollars each. Anyway, everyone, let me know what you think about this NAS in the comments of this video. What would you use it for? Would you buy one for yourself? Or would it be something you might buy a family member? Let's talk about it in the comments of the video. Anyway, it's time for me to go now. Now, I really hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, give it a thumbs up. Please subscribe to the channel. And I'm looking forward to catching you all in that next video.